everybody welcome back to late night review today is the review of trial day number 13. we ended day 12 with colin albert on the stand and we continue or start today with trial day 13 with colin on the stand we learned that colin albert was a ring bearer in courtney proctor's wedding if you remember who the proctors were we have uh, michael proctor who is the lead investigator lead detective for this case so colin albert was the ring bearer in courtney proctor's wedding courtney proctor is the sister to michael proctor and in this photo which was presented in court you can see colin in the photo as well as michael and of course courtney because it's her wedding so we learned that michael proctor is the one that interviewed colin albert for this investigation when Trooper Proctor was talking with Colin, he talked to him for about 10 minutes at the DA's office. Colin agreed to the description that Michael Proctor was, was as nice as he always was, but added that he was a little more professional with the interview. It was unfortunate at this time that they got a bite from the amnesia bug. And the crazy part is it always only bites when defense is asking the questions. But when prosecution is asking these questions, they're full of answers. So here we go with questions and non-answers. Mr. Jackson from defense actually questioned Colin about all his forgetfulness and even asked him at one point if he was advised by counsel to say, I don't remember he responded with a no. He was not advised to that. Now, I wanna play some video footage because the screenshot that was provided of the conversation between him and Allie is questionable. And the reason why I say this is because we learn that separate from Allie's testimony, how she provided the screenshot of the conversation between her and Colin, Colin also did the same thing and provided a screenshot of their conversation to the DA. So let's take a look at that film. You see what's displayed on the screen? Yes. It's only part of the, the text stream, but does that look like it's an accurate representation of what you're looking at? Yes. And this is a series of texts uh, on or about January 28th and 29th of 2022, is that right? Yes. And Mr. Albert, you needed something as simple as a, as a ride. You were just asking Ali to give you a ride, is that right? Yes. And that's because you said that uh, it's common for you guys to text back and forth. You just texted her, hey, you can get me now. Is that right? Yes. And then you texted if it's easier. And then she said, okay, I'm dropping people off. And there was an exchange back and forth. Is that right? Yeah. And there were at least eight texts between the two of you, if you just count them up real quick, just about getting picked up. Yeah. But if you scroll down a little bit, after the end of that text stream that ends at 12, 10 a.m., it says, okay. Do you see the next date? Yes. What date is that? <laughs> February 20th. That's nearly a month later, correct? Correct. So there was a gap after January 29th, 2022, when you found out that a man had ended up dead on your uncle's lawn, and you and Allie did not text each other for a month, not once. Objection. Sustained is to that form, ask it differently. <clears throat> Isn't it true that on January 29th, later in the day, you found out about John O'Keefe and his condition, the fact that he died. Jackson. Is that true? Did you find out that day? Yes. Okay. You were well aware, Mr. Albert, that something very tragic <coughs> had happened at your uncle's house, Brian Albert's house, right? Correct. And you were aware that you had been at your uncle's house that night, right? Correct. You were also aware that, according to you, Allie McCabe was the one that picked you up and took you from that location. Correct. And notwithstanding the fact of this tragedy, you and Ali didn't text each other <coughs> one time for a month. Is that right? I don't think that's correct. So where are those texts? We text on other platforms too. So I'd say other apps. So is there a reason why you decided for the next month to just switch platforms to Maybe Snapchat? Objection. I'll allow it. No reason. Are you sure that you switch platforms? I'd say so, yeah. Why did you switch platforms? We go back and forth, I'd say, between platforms texting. You switch platforms because you know that Snapchat deletes all communications, correct? Objection. And ask it differently, Mr. Jackson. Do you know that Snapchat has an auto-delete function on it? If your app is set to that, yes. Your app was set to that, wasn't it? 
I do not remember that. So again, your memory is failing. Can you rephrase that? <laughs> sure. Once again, your memory is failing. So he was asked if he still has the same phone and he said he did. Mr. Jackson had also asked if there had been an extraction done from his phone by law enforcement, which would be either Michael Proctor or anyone who decided to ask him for this information. And he said, no, nobody asked for the extraction. He was asked, if you still have the phone, why did you provide a screenshot of the conversation and not just sh take the phone out, the actual phone out and show him the conversation between him and Allie, the messages? And he responded with, I'm not sure. Really? A photograph was shown of Colin Albert at a bar on February 26th, so that was less than a month after John O'Keefe had been killed. He claimed that he got his knuckles cut. He was at a party and it was had snowed, so the driveway was slippery and he was carrying a beverage. <laughs> he was carrying a beverage in his hand at this party and slipped, and when he slipped, put his knuckles out to catch himself. This is his story, not mine. Mr. Jackson had asked him if he had any type of violent tendencies. He said no. Mr. Jackson asked him if he'd ever been in a fight, and he said no. I don't beat all your asses. I promise you, I don't fuck you all up. Pull up, bitch. Okay, so you said you were in a fight. So prior to showing that footage, foundation was laid and Colin was allowed to answer these questions according to his knowledge of himself and then claiming he doesn't like to fight, he's never been in a fight, so on and so forth. And then we get this video footage of him making threats to these individuals. Who was that taken? Maybe my sophomore year in high school, around. Where were you? Don't remember. Okay. So where. your sophomore year in high school, that's about three or four years ago? Yeah, around, around. You indicated on cross-examination you've never been in a fight? No. Indicating that you're, you have no violent tendencies and no violent proclivities, right? Nope. What were you saying on that video? That I would beat them up. Did you say you would beat them up, or did you say, I will fuck you up? I said I will F you up. No, you didn't say, I will F you up. What did you actually say? That I would fuck them up. You also said something about beating somebody's ass, right? Correct. What did that mean? That I would beat them up. <laughs> so when you said, I will fuck you up and I will beat your ass, was that a friendly invitation? No. It was a threat, correct? I don't know if I would call it a threat. I don't? I'm not sure. Someone walks up to you. I'm not going to do it. But if someone did, walked up to you and said, I will fuck you up. I will beat your ass. You wouldn't take that as a threat? If they walked up to me, yeah. Uh, but if they didn't walk up and just shouted it across the street and stood there and said, I will fuck you up. I will beat your ass. That's not a threat. I'm not sure. Were you threatening? Advantage boys, guys, whoever they are? Yeah, kinda. Were you kinda. threatening them with violence? Kinda, yeah. Yeah. Um, in the second video, you said, fuck you a number of times. You said, pull up, KO, bang, bang. Right? Correct. Explain that to me. I'm not sure, like, explain what I said. Is that a threat? Yeah. Pull up, bitch. Right? Yeah. Who are you talking to? Those same advantage kids. Got it. So you're threatening them yet again a second time. Yeah. What does pull up mean? Like come by? Yeah, meaning get over here. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Because when you do, I'm going to fuck you up, right? Yeah. Meaning I'm going to fight you and I'm going to put you down. Correct? Correct. That was your threat to them. Correct. Colin explained that the reason why he was sending those threatening videos was because a couple girls in his friend's group hung out with some guys from some opposing hockey team a few times. So, quote, all my guy friends got a little salty about it. So that's why we sent videos back and forth. 
end quote. He also stated he wasn't part of the hockey team. What I find questionable about that is, and I'm wishing Mr. Jackson would have caught this, but he has his own questioning questions to ask. But I think with that particular response of all my guy friends got a little salty about it. So that's why we sent videos back and forth. So here is a good example of him and his friends. Okay, don't look at John. This has nothing to do with John right now. This is Colin and his friends, how they react when a female that they feel is theirs associates with another male that they don't want them associating with. And so their reaction, I know Colin says, all my friends got a little salty about it. However, we don't see his friends making these videos. We see Colin making these videos, uh, threatening these individuals. They're gonna, that he's gonna beat their ass, that he's gonna fuck them up. That particular thing stands out to me in, in behavior and shows me that Colin is apt to violence does show violent tendencies when it comes to fighting over girls. You do like to fight, don't you? Nope. The fact of the matter is, you showed up at another hearing, at another proceeding, to testify, and you showed up with busted knuckles then too, didn't you? I do not remember. July 27th, 2023, do you mean, remember being at another hearing? Yes. You remember being questioned by some attorneys? Yes. Remember the question about the condition of your fist literally at the hearing? Yeah. You were asked questions by the questioner about the condition, the physical condition of your fist, weren't you? Correct. They were asking because you had open injuries on your right knuckles yet again, didn't you? Correct. You said, nah, I must have been he heavy, hitting a heavy bag, right? Yeah. Boxing again. Hit in the bag, yeah. Just working out, right? Yep. Didn't have any injuries on your left hand, though, did you? No. So only your right hand gets injured over and over and over and over again. Not your left hand. I'm not sure. Even though you punch in the bag with both hands. I'm not sure. You're right-handed, aren't you? Yes. So when you throw a haymaker, your hardest punch, that's with your right fist, right? Objection. I'll allow it. Is that right? I would say they got, they have equal. We have him with damage on his knuckles at one time from him saying he was carrying a beverage and tripped and fell and caught himself by putting his hand upside down and trying to catch himself. And then we have the more questioning done at another time. So these are different injuries, separate date. And he has injuries again on his right knuckles. And for this particular time, he said it was done by hitting a punching bag. He was questioned at another time about this at another hearing and back at that time he said junior or senior year which would have been the same year that John had died however in today's hearing in this trial his answer to when that took place was his sophomore year now if we move ourselves back to the trial at hand we have Colin being hidden right we didn't even know he was at this house because it wasn't learned until defense investig you know did their own investigation and found out that Colin was at this house that night and nobody mentioned that he was there and next on the stand is Matthew McCabe Matthew McCabe is Allie's Allie McCabe's father he was the one driving the vehicle home that night giving Julie and Sarah a ride home you got to remember that Matthew McCabe is Nicole Albert's brother-in-law Matthew is married to Nicole's sister, Jennifer. Matt said John introduced Karen Reed to him like a year or two prior to this incident. We learn with Matthew that he went to the Waterfall Bar that night on January 28th with the group in question here. And he said that they left shortly after midnight. Now we also learn with Matt that they were actually all waiting for Brian Albert Jr. to get to the bar that night, but found out that he didn't end up showing up because he had stayed home with some friends. Matthew also said that everyone was invited back to Brian Albert's home to have to wish happy birthday to Brian Albert Jr. He said his wife got a text from John asking where to. So once everybody left the bar that night, Jennifer, his wife, Matt's wife, got a text from John O'Keefe asking where to, and Jennifer called John O'Keefe instead of texting back. 
and she gave him the 34 Fairview, Fairview address. He said that John called again a few minutes later because they couldn't find the the house. Now, Matthew describes that the directions he takes from the Waterfall Bar over to the 34 Fairview house takes about four minutes. It's a four minute drive. And he said he got there at about 12.30 a.m. and left home at about 1.45 a.m. And he was also asked if Colin Albert was at the house when he got there and he said no. We also find out that Matthew saw a dark SUV parked out front and assumed it was John O'Keefe. He said he looked out again a few minutes later because they thought it was weird they hadn't come in yet. He said that SUV at that time moved forward down the road or it had moved forward down the road still in front of the yard though and he looked out a third time and saw the SUV had SUV had moved further forward past the flagpole kind of past the Albert's yard. He said there were tire marks in the snow that were wavy. He said they could have been from the vehicle Julie's brother was in like from him backing up and then going around the vehicle or it could have been from the SUV itself. He did he wasn't sure. He said he thinks he looked out again and the black SUV was gone at that point. He got home around 2.10 and then he talked to his wife for a little and then went to sleep and that he woke up on January 29th, which is the same day because, right, this is already 2.10 in the morning. So he woke up later that morning to screams in his bedroom. And that is the way testimony ends today. We don't know what the screams were, who they were from, but I would imagine we will find out tomorrow on day 14.